Shaksari is canceled um, due to a family medical emergency she had, uh, but we're trying to get her back for the spring, so stay tuned. Um, so for today's colloquium, I'm pleased to introduce you all to Dr. Robert Moore, uh, a professor I very much enjoyed studying with here at Penn, uh, who will be sharing with us a talk titled, From Mother Tongues to Mission Readability, Languages in the Extinction System. Uh, Dr. Moore teaches in the Educational Linguistics Division at Penn's Graduate School of Education. Uh, he earned his PhD in Linguistics and Anthropology uh, in 2000 from the University of Chicago. Uh, and he's previously taught at the National University of Ireland, NYU, Reed College, and the University of Illinois. Uh, Dr. Moore has wide-ranging research interests within linguistics and anthropology, uh, including issues of language obsolescence and preservations among American Indians in the Pacific Northwest, specifically at the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon, as well as the politics of accents surrounding speaking English in contemporary Ireland. Uh, he is also interested in the politics of multilingualism and in the semiotics of branding. Uh, so please well, join me in welcoming Dr. Moore to the board. Thank you, Catherine, for that wonderful introduction. And um, I want to thank the organizers of the uh, Oakland series for uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a real uh, treat for me to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of do a combination of reading and is this uh, not? Can everybody hear? Can everybody hear? Okay. Is it louder? Is it louder? A little louder? Uh, is it louder? Testing? Better? Okay. So uh, I, I will do a, a, wow. um, a bit of a bit of reading and a bit of uh, talking. Um, many would agree that the global phenomenon of, of language endangerment, in all likelihood, uh, represents the most significant uh, the most significant problem ever faced by linguistics. The loss of languages has been framed as a crisis for all of humankind on a planetary scale. The contemporary discourse of language endangerment or extinction has already raised public awareness of linguistics to unprecedented levels, enhancing the prestige of field-based and applied work in the discipline and attracting funding and support from a wide range of governmental and non-governmental organizations, along with worldwide media attention. Uh, the contemporary phase of concern, activism, and new research initiatives on language endangerment is really a product of the 1990s. I uh, did a, a few years ago, I did a kind of primitive um, Lexus Nexus search uh, using endangered languages. Is that coming from me? <laughs> I think it's just a very sensitive mic. Okay. Using endangered languages at, as the search term. <laughs> Dear. My language is endangered now. Um, uh, and you can see, like, uh, in 1990, there was one article in the English language press on this subject, and later, uh, just an explosion. Um, uh, now, the specific discourse of language endangerment that concerns me today really emerged in linguistics with the publication in the uh, Linguistic Society of America's flagship journal, Language, of a cluster of articles uh, by Ken Hale, Michael Krauss, and others in 1992 that summoned the discipline of linguistics to address an urgent crisis of, linguistic, of language diversity. Allowing that language loss has been a reality through history, the late Ken Hale asserted that, and I'm quoting now, language loss in the modern period is of a different character it's in its extent and in its implications. It is part of a much larger process of loss of cultural and intellectual diversity. That was in all caps, but I'm not going to shout. <laughs> Uh, uh, loss of cultural and intellectual diversity in which politically dominant languages and cultures simply overwhelm indigenous lo local languages and cultures. The process is not unrelated to the simultaneous loss of diversity in the zoological and botanical worlds. We understand to some extent the dangers inherent in the loss of biological diversity on Earth. 
it, it is correct to ask, I think, whether there are also dangers inherent in the loss of linguistic diversity. Many more publications in scholarly journals and the mass media followed, utilizing the same analogy between endangered languages and endangered species, sometimes metaphorically, often literally. Um, the, the years following 1992, the quincentenary of the Columbus expedition, also saw the founding of a number of organizations and initiatives dedicated to the issues. So, um, uh, you can see it really takes off in the mid-90s. You have a whole alphabet soup here of organizations. Most of these, um, most of these are engaged both in uh, supporting documentation research and in archiving uh, material. So 1996, uh, Terra Lingua, uh, organized uh, by uh, um, Louisa Maffey in Canada and the U.S. as a nonprofit, uh, explicitly groups language loss uh, with species extinction under a single heading of biocultural diversity. It's, uh, it's just a footnote, but I, I, I learned in uh, rereading some of this material that uh, uh, Terra Lingua received an unsolicited Ford Foundation grant in some, I forget the amount of millions of dollars. It struck me as, uh, you know, like the Ford Foundation literally knocked on their door and handed them money. I was reminded of something I read recently in a completely unrelated context of the uh, late American cultural critic, uh, now forgotten. What is that? Maybe when you bump up against the, the settings. Okay. <laughs> the late American cultural critic Dwight MacDonald must describe the Ford Foundation as a large body of money completely surrounded by people who want some. <laughs> <laughs> so Terrell Lingua did okay. Uh, the Rosetta Project is another kind of interesting organization. It's based in Northern California. Uh, it's kind of a front persons are uh, Stuart Brand, who some of you of a certain age may remember as the uh, um, uh, publisher of the Whole Earth Catalog, and then Brian Eno, the, uh, the musician, um, are the kind of uh, public face of the Long Now Foundation, but the money comes from uh, uh, Silicon Valley <coughs> billionaires who've discovered um, um, a conscience. Uh, this discourse of language endangerment will occupy me for most of this talk. I want to investigate its epistemological and language ideological foundations, and I want to illustrate the kinds of linguistic scholarship carried out under its terms, focusing especially on the design of digital technologies intended for the archiving of endangered language data. Throughout, I will be asking a number of interrelated questions. To which aspects of the process of language endangerment does such discourse draw our attention? To which aspects of language does it draw our attention? What does it obscure? This dominant discourse of endangered languages privileges a conception of languages as neatly bounded, hence countable, autonomous grammatical system, systems, each corresponding to a neatly bounded worldview, familiar to uh, anthropology students. Uh, however useful this formulation may be in raising public consciousness of the richness of language diversity, it also, I think, draws attention away from the speech community dynamics of language contact and change that we know to have been central to virtually every documented case of language shift or replacement. Among its unintended consequences is that it may also mislead linguists and the general public about the extent and type of sociolinguistic diversity that is characteristic of today's globalized world. So I want to talk about what I'm calling the extinction system. Uh, first thing to realize is that this discourse of endangered languages is continuous with much broader discourses of endangerment of biological species, wild as well as cultivated or domesticated, uh, of whole ecosystems, think of the coral reefs, of forms of traditional environmental knowledge, DEK, or uh, traditional foodways, and of course, cultures. I call it the extinction system, intending a reference to Roland Barthes' idea of the fashion system. Now, um, compare a quotation from the Endangered Languages Project with another one from another domain. I don't usually like to inflict a lot of text on people in slides, but if you have a look at these, you'll see why I was unable to resist. So, languages, apples. 
it's a, exactly the same uh, kind of framing of the issue. Um, um, an, an international team of scientists and other experts responded to the diversity crisis in, um, in food plants by establishing the Svalbard International Seed Vault in Arctic Norway, a, quote, Noah's Ark for the world's most important plants and a repository for crucial seeds in the event of a global catastrophe. Um, this facility will provide a practical means to reestablish crops obliterated by major disasters, said Carrie Fowler, the executive secretary of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, which will manage the seed bank. But crop diversity is imperiled not just by a cataclysmic event, such as a nuclear war, but also by natural disasters, accidents, mismanagement, and short-sighted budget cuts. End quote. Uh, in 2006, when the seed bank was established, there were immediate reasons for concern. Quoting again, during the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, the National Seed Bank in Abu Ghraib was looted, and rare varieties of wheat, lentil, and chickpea were destroyed. Two years earlier in Afghanistan, the Taliban obliterated a bank containing ancient types of walnuts, almonds, peaches, and other fruits. Funding for the project comes from a 130 million pound endowment, including, including, yes? Syria has just made the first withdrawal from the Svalbard Seed Bank. Who, oh, Syria really? has. Really? Oh, really? Okay. Right. Interesting. Um, funded, funding comes from a 130 million pound endowment, including a 15 million pound grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Governments from countries as diverse in America, as diverse as America and Ethiopia, along with companies such as the agricultural researchers Syngenta, the chemicals multinational DuPont, and farming organizations. Britain itself is donating some 10 million pounds over four years. The point, obviously, is to take these precious resources, expropriate them, aggregate them, and then re-sequester them in some faraway location where they will be safe from the depredations of politics, war, and global instability under the watchful care of human experts and polar bears. Another quote. The new seed bank will store its samples in a reinforced concrete tunnel drilled 70 meters into a mountain guarded by two steel doors and remote controlled from Sweden. Something I've ever heard that. No, no. What? <clears throat> the seeds will be stored in foil packets at minus 18 centigrade and are expected to remain viable for thousands of years. If a crop is lost through natural disaster or war and a seed bank is destroyed, a government could request replacement seeds from the vault, as apparently has just happened. The facility's remote location and permafrost will ensure that even if the power fails, the temperature will never rise above freezing. Though the facility will be fenced in and guarded, guarded Svalbard's free-roaming polar bears, known for their ferocity, could also act as natural guardians. <laughs> so, the seeds are returned to nature, but under supervision in a place where nature imitates laboratory conditions and where the seeds themselves become data points classified using metadata linked to an ontology based on the phylogenetic family tree model of Linnaean classification. What, we, what, I want to, what we'll see is exactly the same logic applied to the preservation of languages. Linguists, especially those self-identified with the emerging sub-discipline of documentary linguistics, have responded to the linguistic diversity crisis as they conceive it in strikingly similar ways. <clears throat> the endangered languages discourse has been applied in the effort to construct digital archives of endangered <coughs> language data, including online corpora of machine readable material, from texts and transcriptions to audio and video files that are searchable via the tagging of these pieces of content using annotations and metadata. More on that in a, in a minute. Right now, the point is to understand how the endangered languages discourse fits into a much broader extinction system that is observable in many domains. Whether the topic is plant seeds or languages, the phenomenon of endangerment is understood here in terms of a single set of common assumptions. First, that uh, diversity of biological species, languages, cultures, etc., is being dramatically reduced. The world is moving rapidly toward a global monoculture. Second, diversity in all these realms can be measured and risks to diversity can be quantified, which obviously entails the participation of experts. 
Um, third, the species, languages, cultures, etc., that are maximally vulnerable to the forces of global monoculture share a set of characteristics. They are small, isolated, immobile, and tradition-bound in every way other with respect to our own open, cosmopolitan, hyper-mediatized forms of life. Is there a denial of coevalness, to use Johannes Fabian's phrase uh, here at all? Language endangerment is often framed as a recent phenomenon brought about by globalization and modernity, but above all, it is positioned in the extinction system as, a, as an exceptional state. The planet's languages are now suddenly on the brink of oblivion. Languages that have existed for thousands of years in an unbroken chain of seamless transmission within small, isolated, non-mobile language communities may suddenly cease to exist, perhaps even becoming extinct on a mass scale. But framing language endangerment as exceptional, both recent and unprecedented, may carry certain risks of its own. Do we not then position as normal the Herderian fantasy of discrete languages and cultures existing for thousands of years in unbroken transmission within linguistically and culturally homogeneous communities expressing a culturally unique worldview and producing generation upon generation of that obscure object of modernist linguistic desire, Chomsky's fully fluent monolingual speaker in a completely homogeneous language community. It's interesting that just at the moment that the Herderian fantasy, one people, one language, one ancestral territory, one culture, becomes patently unsustainable within Europe, it gets outsourced to distant and exotic places. To answer these and related questions, we must briefly examine the infrastructure of the extinction system as it pertains to languages. I'll briefly describe three interrelated parts of the system. The ethnologue, which produces names for languages, enabling them and their speakers to be counted. Second, the emerging subfield of documentary linguistics, which is dedicated to fact gathering about endangered languages in brief and highly focused field encounters. And finally, the use of what are called ontologies in the design of digital archives of endangered language data. In my conclusion, I point out certain aspects of sociolinguistic diversity that uh, might um, have been missed. Okay, so first, the ethnologue. Um, the ethnologue uh, is a website and print publication of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, SIL. It's the standard reference source for the listing and enumeration of endangered languages and for all known and living languages of the world. Brief quote here from the, from the site. Um, the purpose of the ethnologue is to provide a comprehensive listing of the known living languages of the world. Information can, comes from numerous sources and is confirmed by consulting both reliable published sources and a network of field correspondence. Information is compiled under several specific categories, and no effort is made to gather data beyond these categories. It's intended more as a catalog than an encyclopedia. It's a little hard to describe if you haven't consulted it, um, uh, but you can, well, okay. It, it, the ethnologue emer, originated in 1951 as 10 mimeograph pages of information on 46 languages or groups of languages compiled by Richard S. Pittman of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, who was uh, motivated by the desire to share information on language development needs around the world with his colleagues in SIL International. Now, language development, as you may know, is a term of art in SIL circles for collaborative projects undertaken in situ by SIL workers working with local native speakers and leading to the development of a writing system, usually a phonemic alphabet, for the language which then enables Bible translation work, usually starting with one of the Gospels. Uh, in Melanesia, the Gospel of Mark is the, is the first one, usually. Uh, you can see the recent uh, great book by Courtney Hanman on um, Bible translation in Papua New Guinea. Um, the signal achievement of the Ethnologue Project and its key contribution to the infrastructure of the extinction system is its establishment and promulgation of a set of unique three-letter identification codes on the order of international airport codes for each and every language. The three-letter identification codes developed in and by the Ethnologue are indeed now the industry standard. A major funding initiative undertaken jointly by the U.S. National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, requires their use in all applications for funding. Now, the uh, compilers of the Ethnologue are aware of the ambiguities involved in language naming and the political sensitivities attached thereto. Indeed, it's, it, it would be fair to say that they're obsessed with matters of 
Glossonomy. The 15th edition includes an index of 39,491 distinct names that are associated with the 7,299 languages in this edition. Uh, they write, Ethnologue writes, uh, scholars recognize that languages are not always easily or best treated as discrete, identifiable, and countable units with clearly defined boundaries between them. <coughs> However, the, the compilers of the Ethnologue um, remain uh, committed to, quote, the ethnologue approach to listing and counting languages as if they were discrete units, arguing that it does not preclude a more dynamic understanding of the linguistic makeup of countries and regions we report on. They allow, end quote, uh, the compilers allow the legitimacy of these al alternate views of languages. For example, quoting again, as continua of features across time and space, waves, that are best studied in terms of variational tendencies as examples of change in progress. The ethnologue nonetheless focuses primarily on the unitary nature of languages without prejudice to against the other perspectives, end quote. So the three-letter airport code language kind of hyper names are the key to that part of this system. Now, documentary linguistics. The emergence of documentary linguistics has occasioned, uh, quoting Karen Rice now, uh, current president, I think, of the LSA, uh, has occasioned new debates about the balance between theory and empirical work in linguistics. Documentary linguistics is focused on the collection and archiving of data and has tried to develop principles relating to collection, archiving, and analysis of a diverse corpus. The literature of documentary linguistics grounds itself stylistically and rhetorically in the literature of engineering, including, of course, software engineering. Hence the emphasis on lists and on the establishment of industry standards and best practices. Criteria for the Volkswagen-funded DOBES, D-O-B-E-S, DOBES project, for example, require that, quote, each documentation is carried out in close cooperation with the community and reflects the particular characteristics of the respective culture. A common sense standard that few would disagree with. And yet nothing is said about how one goes about discovering the particular characteristics of the respective culture, nor about how such knowledge of the respective culture should inform the practices involved in language documentation. The point is that the enumeration of best practices outlined in the literature of documentary, in the enumeration of best practices outlined in the literature of documentary linguistics, culture is treated as an externality, a source of constraints on a theory-neutral and culture-neutral activity of documentation. This is another legacy from engineering, wherein end users of a technology are conceptualized as being outside of it. Now, Anthony Woodbury uh, sees the fundamental conceptual shift introduced by document documentary linguistics in the way that self-professed documentary linguists insist on a strict separation between documentation or direct representation of naturally occurring discourse, quote, quote, unquote, and description, which is treated as more or less synonymous with analysis, in which primary data are a means to an end, that is, the analysis of the linguistic system. Primary data are generally not presented in full, but only as exemplification of analytic statements. This is from uh, Klaus Himmelman, one of the founders of this subfield. So just to clarify, uh, the, the position of documentary linguistics is, is that they are not doing anything related to theory. They are not documenting languages in the service of any analytic program or approach. It's just the facts, uh, ma'am. And, uh, and of course, you know, under a kind of a, in a kind of environment of urgency. I think, uh, I think it's worth questioning whether direct representation of naturally occurring discourse is possible or even desirable. Woodbury, <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Woodbury points to the overwhelming emphasis in documentary linguistics on, quote, recurrent searchable <coughs> metadata categories that are used to create the electronic equivalent of card catalog information for any given item of text or other linguistic data in a digital archive. And Woodbury, quote, end quote. And Woodbury rightly suggests that this is neither atheoretical nor pre-theoretical, but rather, quoting Woodbury again, rests crucially on and in fact partly constitutes this emergent theorization of documentation, end quote. Now, as far as I'm concerned, to theorize documentation as untheoretical is still to theorize about it. Documentary linguistics manages to revive 
the field linguistic <coughs> procedures, lexical elicitation, recording of narrative texts, and so forth, of Boazian linguistics in a salvage mode while emptying out all of its intellectual content. Within the discipline, documentary linguistics has been a kind of rear guard action, arguing, for example, that PhD degrees in linguistics should be awarded for documentary projects that do not, on principle, make contributions to linguistic theory. Um, they, may have disavowed, they may have disavowed any uh, ambitions to theory, but the proponents of documentary linguistics are preoccupied now with the obsolescence of the database infrastructure in terms of which their own uh, digital archives and corpora of endangered language data are organized. Turning inward to reflect on their own practices, documentary linguists have become consubstantial with the very languages that are their primary concern. Quoting now uh, Stephen Byrd, um, one of the major figures in documentary linguistics, in the very generation when the rate of language death is at its peak, we have chosen to use more abundant technologies and to create endangered data. But there is no trace of irony when they come to reflect that when the technologies, when the technologies die, unique heritage is either lost or encrypted. In this case, unique heritage is associated with now obsolete database infrastructures. Fortunately, the authors assert, linguists can follow best practices in digital language documentation and description, greatly increasing the likelihood that their work will survive in the long term. Documentary linguists long for a return to, this, to a state of, uh, of perfect consensus and unanimity uh, that will prevail within the field of linguistics, quote, if different parties can agree on the motivating values and come to agreement on the evaluation of competing practices of database architecture and design. Okay, moving on, part, third piece, ontologies. Now, among the requirements, as mentioned before, imposed by the NEH NSF Documenting Endangered Languages Funding Initiative is that a proposal's title should use the three-letter SIL code to identify the languages to be studied, uh, and that a proposal summary should identify the family of the languages to be studied. In the introduction to the program solicitation, we are told that, quoting, at least half of the world's six to 7,000 currently used human languages are about to be lost. About 300 languages now have fewer than 100 native speakers. These endangered languages constitute an irreplaceable treasure, not only for the communities who speak them, but also for scientists and scholars. Each endangered language embodies unique local knowledge of the cultures and natural, cultural and natural systems in the region in which it is spoken. These languages are among the few sources for filling in the record of the human past and the great variety of these languages represents a vast, largely unmapped terrain on which linguists, cognitive scientists, and philosophers can chart the full capabilities and limits of the human mind. This much, okay, end of long quote. This much is familiar, the vision of a finite and shrinking number of neatly bounded languages, each connected to a unique worldview. The news is that, quote, recent advances in information technology can make it possible not only to document endangered languages before they perish, but also to integrate and analyze that body of knowledge in unprecedented ways. Warming to their view of an emerging utopian future, the usually sober officials of the NSF and the H envision how, quote, computerization of speech and universal internet access can transform the practice of linguistics, leading to a kind of complete capture, quote, Point one, the actual sounds of language will be available. Point two, linguists will have uniform access to all data sets, not limited by encoding format. Three, computerization will drive the development of a unified ontology for linguistics. Now notice, like, you know, this is just a piece of, uh, the, the, you know, the rhetoric here should be familiar to everyone uh, as, you know, this is a piece of what you might call techno-triumphalist uh, talk. You know, it's all couched in the future tense. It all talks about, you know, universal internet access doesn't even apply for Philadelphia, right? <laughs> um, it, it's all an envisioned future state of uh, perfection. Um, uh, we must now consider what is meant by a unified ontology for linguistics. The best source of information is surely the EMELD project. EMELD being an acronym for Electronic Metastructure for Endangered Languages Data. Uh, the linguist Mark Lieberman of our very own University gives a brief overview of the project on his language log blog. Quoting now, roughly, email aims to solve three problems. 
how to make the documentation of endangered languages durable so that it can still be read and used in 20 or 50 or 100 years, how to make it interpretable as data other than to an informed human eyeball, and how to make it interoperable so that you could search or amalgamate data across descriptions of many different languages by many different people. The durability problem, says Liberman, is both the most important problem and the easiest one to solve. At this layer of the, uh, of the endangered languages discourse, the focus of concern shifts uh, from the preservation of endangered languages as vehicles of communication in local speech communities to the preservation of endangered digital archives uh, uh, here, the urgent call is for standardization, not of the languages themselves, but of the digital infrastructure. Members of the scientific community say emailed on their website are faced with two urgent situations. The number of languages in the world is rapidly diminishing, while the number of initiatives to digitize language data is rapidly multiplying. The primary goal of email is to promote consensus about archive infrastructures. But email also remakes linguistics as a science without the scientist. As at least one commentator has pointed out, the semantic web, so-called, of which email emailed is one manifestation, uh, it represents an attempt to resuscitate an older, failed project called artificial intelligence. Um, after 50 years of work, the, this is a quote, after 50 years of work, the performance of machines designed to think about the world the way humans do has remained, to put it politely, suboptimal. The semantic web sets out to address this by reversing the problem. Since it's hard to make machines think about the world, the new goal is to describe the world in ways that are easy for machines to think about. <laughs> Email pro pro promulgates a standardized format based on conventions established as part of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative to enable resource discovery, meaning, of course, the discovery of resources <coughs> by machines. Now, the prevalence of names in this use of the DC element set to provide <coughs> resource metadata for an online grammar of a small indigenous language of Argentina called Moco V. <coughs> the last line there is the interesting one. Content. So meta name, Dublin core language. Content, danger. It's a it's a parameter. Um, um, along with resource metadata, email also seeks to incorporate what it calls typological metadata. Description here allows us to get a sense of the kind of comparative linguistic research that is being, or will eventually be, supported by such efforts. Here's a quote from the email, uh, one of the email documents. Typological information may include generalizing statements about um, the set of types into which a language may fall. For example, subject verb object ordering as opposed to verb subject object. And also the classification of a particular language according to these types. Um, consider then the current organization of an online archive of data on a Canadian Athabascan language called uh, Beaver. And this is from the database of the Volkswagen funded Dolbes project. Maybe hard to read, but I'll leave it up there. there it's not. Um, We'll come back to it in a second. Now, I want to just shift gears a bit and like, let's see if we can kind of pull our heads out of the uh, extinction system and talk about, for a second, and talk about like, what's actually happening. Uh, what does language extinction um, actually involve? And I think here it's important to distinguish, um, um, uh, here I think it's important to uh, distinguish um, between what people have been for decades in sociolinguistics been calling language shift. This is where the, this is a speech community phenomenon in which um, whether uh, over a few generations or over many, many hundreds of years, uh, um, people in a speech community um, move uh, from using one of their linguistic resources uh, uh, and shift away from others. Uh, so um, the process of language shift, right, uh, has taken has been documented beautifully in many places, like Susan Gal's work on the um, the way a village on the Hungarian Austrian border uh, in a few generations shifted from being fairly stably bilingual Hungarian German to being almost completely. Uh, 
German speaking. She, uh, she, she provides detailed and <coughs> elaborate and beautiful sociological reasoning for that. Um, now, when that happened, right, uh, the Hungarian language didn't die because it was still being spoken elsewhere. Um, um, when a community shifts from one language to another and the language that they shift away from isn't spoken anyplace else, then language shift equals language death. But the processes are uh, pretty much the same. Um, uh, um, informed by concepts and methods drawn from anthropology, sociology, and political economy, uh, students of language shift have identified a number of factors that seem to be significant in accounting for people's attitudes towards their language, uh, for accounting for why people's languages, attitudes towards their languages change and why language shift occurs. That's quoting Don Kulik. Uh, whether or not language shift in a given community results in the loss or disappearance of a phylogenetically unique language uh, is uh, obviously a separate matter. Uh, the, the factors that influence people are, often include the usual suspects, migration, industrialization, urbanization, proletarianization, and government policies concerning which languages can and cannot be used in schools and other institutions, notes Kulik. But the crucial point made by all of these authors is that these forces do not act directly upon languages. What is of interest to know, Susan Gal points out, is not whether industrialization, for instance, is correlated with language shift, but rather, by what intervening processes does industrialization or any other social change affect changes in the uses to which speakers put their languages in everyday interactions? Um, Kulik expresses the same idea this way. To say that urbanization or other social change causes shift is to leave out the crucial step of understanding how that change has come to be interpreted by the people it is supposed to be influencing. The real question, says Kulik, is this. Why and how do people come to interpret their lives in such a way that they abandon one of their languages? Viewed in this way, the study of language shift becomes the study of a people's conception of themselves in relation to one another and to their changing social world and of how these conceptions are encoded by and mediated through language. Um, so, um, language shift is not here understood as the statistical or a cumulative result of individual speakers' rational choices. Uh, because it is experienced by speakers as an irreducibly social phenomenon, so it, it must be interpreted, I would say. Um, now, the metadata of interest here are precisely the changing dynamics of indexical values emergent in interaction, whereby various linguistic resources available to people in plurilingual speech communities get re-enregistered privileging some ways of speaking and disprivileging others, right? So this entails, you know, dense ethnographic exploration. So now let's look at our Bieber ontology and let's try to find out where these, this order of facts is uh, stored in the vault, so to speak. Let's see. Right there, look, sociolinguistics. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to become conscious of time. Um, <coughs> um, all of the studies of um, um, language shift cited above, I mean, I'm thinking of, there's many, but, you know, uh, Kulik's work in Papua New Guinea, uh, uh, Jane and Ken Hill's work in central Mexico with Nahuatl, uh, um, Many, many of these studies uh, concentrate on the intensive analysis of a limited community uh, or area and have been produced by linguistically trained ethnographers who make heavy use of participant observation as means of gathering and evaluating data on shift in such communities, Kulik uh, says. Um, the best insights into how processes associated with globalization affect the fates of different languages differently have always come from close and detailed ethnographic studies of local speech communities. The dominant, discourse of the, extinct, the dominant discourses of the extinction system present the reader with a series of puzzling anachronisms. State of the art, if rapidly obsolescing digital technology, is juxtaposed with concepts of culture and language that can only be described as antiquated. Um, the typological metadata being developed by the architects of the email project 
for example, will enable, it's not, I mean, it's not even connected to linguistics. The, the typological metadata being developed by email will enable linguists to find out what languages of the world are SVO or VSO. But typological studies in linguistics have moved on some time ago from debating the terms of Greenberg's influential 1963 article. Reading the now vast scholarly popular literature of language endangerment side by side with the newer but growing literature on sociolinguistic superdiversity is a truly jarring experience. Both literatures purport to describe recent and fundamental changes in the sociolinguistic composition of the contemporary world. Both attribute these changes to forces associated with globalization. And yet, one literature warns us of a drastic reduction in the planet's uh, linguistic diversity, while the other alerts us to the diversification of diversity. Are they even describing the same world? In many ways, they are not. The endangered languages literature, especially in its more popular modes, trades in out-of-the-way locations and relic enclaves of people and peoples left behind by modernity, very far off the beaten path. K. David Harrison's The Last Speakers and Mark Abley's Spoken Here, uh, just to take two examples, both belong partly to the genre of travel literature and are marketed as such. The superdiversity literature, on the other hand, is being produced by sociolinguists and linguistic ethnographers who are chronicling the ways their own cities and their own backyards in Antwerp, London, Copenhagen have been transformed since the 1990s by migration. The literature of superdiversity uh, addresses the sociolinguistic concomitants of a tremendous increase in the categories of migrants <coughs> now present in major European cities not only in terms of nationality, ethnicity, language, and religion, but also in terms of motives, patterns, and itineraries of migration, <coughs> processes of insertion into labor and housing markets, uh, and so forth. That's quoting of Jan Blomart and Ben Rampton's 2011 article on super diversity. Diversely plurilingual environments complex social formations in which denotational codes themselves have come into intimate contact, people controlling a repertoire of variants and registered across more than one language, in Silverstein's phrasing, are themselves nothing new. And here we can see how contemporary urban conditions of superdiversity are connected to the non-urban hinterlands where vulnerable languages fall out of use. Such densely plurilingual environments, marked by diversity both of languages and of speech practices, used to be observed at the peripheries of colonial expansion, of globalization, and of empire, remarks Silverstein. Today, they have moved to the center of the politico-economic north, much to the consternation of policymakers, educationists, and other inhabitants of language-facing institutions in the receiving societies. Okay, a number of important questions remain, and I'm going to be concluding with questions, hoping to stimulate talk, discussion. Okay, can digital infrastructures for the preservation of endangered language data be redesigned in such a way that they can accommodate information not just on the endangered language itself, but on the full range of linguistic resources available to people in the community where the endangered language is or was spoken? Should not best practices in documentary linguistics recognize the importance of documenting the verbal repertoires of the invariably multilingual speakers of an endangered language? as well as the full range of types of recurring communicative events in the community, not only those in which the specific major language is regularly used. Should researchers trained in ethnographic methods, whose work is informed by current questions in sociocultural and linguistic anthropology, be included in endangered language documentation projects? If we continue to file away data samples of endangered languages in our digital archives, like seeds in an underground vault, we are, in fact, effacing uh, documentation of the sociolinguistic processes that led to language shift in the first place, I think. Further, what if sociolinguistic diversity is actually increasing, not decreasing, around the world, albeit taking forms that the endangered languages discourse cannot countenance? What if this recent increase in sociolinguistic diversity in urban centers and rural hinterlands alike reflects not a comforting return to roots, but the increasingly precarious life circumstances experienced by mobile and, by brute necessity, highly adaptable multilingual actors 
who are recognized by the reigning economic system when they are recognized at all as surplus labor at best. As formerly traditional and, other, and in other ways marginalized peoples are swept into the global epimene of late capitalism, what one observes is not so much a loss of diversity, but a widening gulf between two forms of bi- and multilingualism. On the one form, on the one hand, an elite form of bi- and multilingualism, such as the, uh, that observed by Ruth Vodak and her colleagues in the central institutions of the European Union. They studied the code-switching practices of high-level EU bureaucrats, right? Uh, here one observes the skills of school literacy and seamless code-switching between French, German, and other standard average European languages fluently on display with English always available as a fallback. Excuse me, lingua franca. On the other hand, there are the non-elite, proletarian, for lack of a better word, often pathologized forms of multilingualism. The repertoire, the repertoire of a Moroccan barber in the super diverse urban neighborhood of Berkham in Antwerp, for example, might be composed of non-standard Maghrebi, Maghrebi Arabic, some Turkish, bit of French, fragments of Quranic Arabic, some useful phrases in the Flemish dialect of Dutch, and bits and pieces of English. I, I know that because he cut my hair. <laughs> um, um, uh, the, the multilingual repertoire of a fruit picker in Oregon might include Mistec, little or no Spanish, and fragmentary English, all useful in the fruit and vegetable fields, but less so in the courtroom. And here I'm referring to an article by John Haviland about um, a, a fruit picker in Oregon, Mistec speaker, who was accused of murder and uh, was supplied with a Spanish interpreter in the courtroom, a language he was not available in. Um, uh, the elite kind of multilingualism is an asset for Europe, and it's good for business. I'm referring to two uh, encyclicals produced by the e e European Commission. Uh, elite multilingualism is an asset, it's good for business, and it is associated with flexibility, entrepreneurship, and innovation all of which are good things from the perspective of European elites and policymakers. This same perspective associates non-elite forms of multilingualism with unemployment, urban crime, and terrorism. No wonder that the new and non-elite forms of multilingualism associated with superdiversity are seen as a threat in need of remediation, as linguistic markets congeal and multilingual speaker repertoires are re-stratified in ever more punitive and exclusionary ways. Finally, finally, what if our fixation on linguistic diversity conceived in phylogenetic and typological, i.e. grammatical terms, uh, is distracting our attention from another equally important relationship between linguistic diversity and human cognition? What if, rather than concentrating on the implicit worldview somehow encoded differently and yet statically in each distinct grammatical system, we instead were to focus our descriptive documentary and theoretical efforts on describing the ability of speakers and emergent communities of same to develop and deploy complex linguistic repertoires, constantly acquiring and discarding repertoire elements as they move across ideologically saturated spaces and geographical, political, and social boundaries, knowing when, where, and how to switch between these in the conduct of daily life. Should not these skills, obviously relevant to cognition, and acquired under duress, also be documented, valued, and supported. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Question? Question. So, uh, Rob, that was a wonderful and rich uh, paper. There's so many things that came to my mind, uh, you know, as you were uh, giving it. But uh, two things I, I would you know, like to press you on just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, one thing we're looking at is uh, a set of paths in academia. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think about this because, uh, you know, kept going back to the period when I was a graduate student in the 1970s, I recall very vividly Del Himes giving a talk at the, uh, the American Anthropological Society in which the great worry at that point, his great worry, and that of many anthropologists, was the triumph of what was then called generative grammar, 
the publication of syntactic structures back in 1957. The fact that at that point in the 1970s, it was almost impossible to get funding for field research to go actually study uh, a language because everybody was interested in advancing theory. Uh, and that theory meant working on English primarily with a couple of other languages on the periphery. Mm -hmm. So you end up wrote a huge crest, a huge wave. And I have to say that I was part of the group that, you know, tried to say, no, wait a minute, we've got to go back and actually study in the field and record languages. Also, the other stuff you're talking about, right? The ethnographic stuff. But so, you know, I think putting it into context and when people talk about it being atheoretical, it's very specific meaning. Uh, there. It has come to be something else. I think you know, your deconstruction is, is great. So that's one thing you know, just to press you on is the kind of the, what one might think of fads and the, a new fad coming along, the endangerment fad that bumps out the other. And now you're kind of trying to press back against that endangerment fad and say, you know, what about sociolinguistics, ethnography, and so forth. The other thing to, to press you on just a little bit is uh, you know, what was actually going on politically in the world in terms of modernization phenomena. So yeah. when I went off to do research with Brazilian uh, populations back in the 1970s, we worked very closely with the biologists because at that point, of course, you know, the, Brazil was attempting to open up the interior. Uh, they were deforesting areas the size of New Jersey every year. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a very pressing political thing going on there and in other parts of the world also. <laughs> that you know led to the union of people working on things like species uh, extinction uh, and other anthropologists working on cultures and attempting to demarcate territories and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I ended up working indeed on a language that did become extinct. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, and those things were actual practical concerns for local people because court cases. They're trying to reclaim land. To reclaim land, you have to have a language. Yeah. So politically press you on that front also, and maybe it doesn't appear to be so bizarre when you set it in the context of these two major <coughs> trends that we actually see in which the extinction system arose. Yeah. Um, wow. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. There's a lot. No, that's fantastic. There's just a, there's, um, um, well, you know, um, one of the, I think part of the context, well, first of all, the issue of sort of um, fads um, is, um, well, I mean, is an interesting kind of uh, way to approach the recent sort of history of, of, of these kinds of study. Uh, I mean, you know, like when I, when I, put, when I put that slide together with the, with the two quotes, the one about language and the one about apples, right. and they're, they're almost identical to each other. I was thinking of cultural emotion. Yes. Like, in a way, like... <laughs> I was thinking that too. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 uh, um, but, but, but um, you know, Part of the broader um, political and institutional context, I think that in which people like uh, you and me and others, I mean, you know, who have been especially connected to uh, indigenous communities, have, have been operating, is a real shift in the um, a real shift in the role relationships of anthropologists and community, local community people. Um, that really, I think, I mean, it, it's def kind of defined my experience, and it kind of um, unfolds in that very same, like, post-1990 time period, in which things like, like in the community I've been, you know, in contact with for a long time, at Warm Springs, it was around that time that, um, that uh, um, the elders who knew the languages were themselves sort of being redefined as, as, Assets, right. uh, where um, where uh, um, you know minerals, water resources, um, traditional food gathering areas were being mapped, uh, right, and sort of secured. So there's a, and, and in, the, in the process, like I found myself. I mean, I I did I helped carry out uh, for an archaeology for an archaeology firm, a private archaeology firm contracted by the Warm Springs tribes to produce a kind of ethnographic survey of a nearby nas national forest. So we were now consultants in a way. We were in a consultative and, uh, uh, and our ex relationship and our expertise was being used to authenticate uh, and support various kinds of claims. So, I don't know where. 
so there have been a, some, some major shifts in the kind of um, roles and uh, relationships between anthropologists and communities that I see is going right along with, well, historically, kind of since 1990. And of course, there in America, I'm not going to go on forever, sorry. But I mean, in, in the US, there are incredibly important pieces of federal legislation that are, that are creating the uh, environment in which these transformations occur. NAGPRA, right? Um, the Native American Languages Act, Bulletin 38 of the, of the National Park Service that defines what a traditional cultural property is. You know, when I was doing that project on Mount Hood National Forest, we were identifying TCPs. And we were, had to memorize, you know, Bulletin 38 became like a, 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 a sacred text, right? Um, and, you know, strangely, I was just thinking about this recently, that we had these meetings between, I was part of a team of three ethnographers, we worked with the archaeologists. The archaeologists would come back from meetings with, with uh, Forest Service employees, and they would talk, they would use this way of talking, they'd say, the forest is very concerned about <laughs> safeguarding traditional berry picking areas. The forest is kind of worried about, and there was this whole language in which the forest, right, was, was figured as a thinking, acting, communicating, emoting uh, being, and you know, this is long before Eduardo Cohn, right? <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, I guess this is a rambling, but, but I mean, you, you raised a couple of really important issues, I think. Um, you see, okay, finally, let me just kind of bring this to some kind of end, if not conclusion, that my response to your thing is that, I mean, there's a whole dimension of this endangered languages database stuff that is uh, really kind of an intellectual property uh, activity and is really a resource extraction activity. Uh, you know, you can, I mean, uh, this is why ethnobotany and ethnobiology are centrally important to these projects, right? Because traditional environmental knowledge could include, you know, I mean, I have, have somewhere, I have that, I didn't use it here, but there's a, you know, I've seen a documentary linguist quoted as saying, you know, one of these tribes may have a name for a plant that leads us to a plant that will contain a chemical that can cure Alzheimer's disease. So this is what Michael Silverstein calls glotto prospecting. <laughs> right? On the analogy to bioprospecting. Except here it's, I mean, there the connection to bioprospecting is direct. But I mean, even when we're collecting uh, exotic and unusual grammatical structures to, to inform linguistic theorizing, um, it has some of those qualities. I don't know if I address any of your. Great. <laughs> no, okay. There were other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been thinking that. Uh, do you think that recording all this information about languages that are on the verge of going to extinction would actually accelerate their extinction? Because now we have a record of them. We don't need to preserve this anymore. Um, no, I don't, I don't really think so. Um, I mean, one of the, these kinds of efforts can have a lot of interesting effects in the communities where they go on, or, or they take place. And I mean, and really, this also is nothing new, but um, in the process, people in local communities, both speakers of endangered languages and their grandchildren, uh, uh, become linguists. I mean, they learn linguistics, they, they, and, and, and in fact, it, you know, even if the even if the documentary linguists have um, gone back to Philadelphia or somewhere, there are there are sometimes. I mean, I know of cases personally of people continuing on with really often quite ambitious and sophisticated uh, projects of documenting their own languages. So. I wouldn't want to generalize, but I mean, I don't, I, I don't see, I, I don't see, um... In other words, yeah. you could let them go extinct now, because we have a record of it. So they're not, we don't need, now that we have the record, we have information about them, we can let them go. Yes. Okay. I think you have a... Can I make a comment yes. in relation yeah. to that? Um, because I've done an ethnographic study of revitalization, documentation, documentation in practice. And as Rob says, it has a lot of motivating influences in the local community. So in terms of the perspective 
of the speakers of the language, it usually serves, in, in the case I worked in, serves to raise their interest and motivation and their metalinguistic awareness and, and all of these. In terms of how academics will perceive it, academics might check it, up, check it off the list. So when I apply to the major language documentation project to work on a language that they say has already been documented, they won't give me money. So from academics, your perspective is probably correct, in my experience, but in the local community, I think it's the opposite. Well, part of the, I'm sorry, I'm, we'll get you right, one second, but I mean, part of the, uh, going back to the, 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 the things that were bothering people like Hines in the 70s about generative grammar, um, uh, you know, what, what you say is kind of partly true of, uh, of heavily formalist Chomsky and derived formal linguists. I mean, you know, the, the trend there has been, you know, to kind of, you can, I mean, if you read the pages of journals like the Linguistic Inquiry, you know, you, you can, you get, the, you get the sense that for hardcore theoretical linguists, you really only need to know like three facts about a language, and, and you know, then you can kind of move on. So, yeah, tick the box and forget about it now may, may apply to some of, some people, but I mean, I'm concerned, I mean, in my own trawling of some of these online archives, I mean, the, so far the quality of the, the quality of the stuff that's available is not very good. I mean, in languages I have some, some way of knowing independently about. Um, and this idea of a future of perfect consensus and universal transparency and universal availability of the data I mean, one of the, the obstacles that that comes up against is the fact that the communities who supply the data often would like to restrict availability. I mean, anybody who's worked in museums uh, knows, uh, you know, <laughs> knows about that in the, in the realm of material culture. Right? I mean, this is part of what gives these forms of cultural life meaning is that they aren't just out there and available for everybody to look at. Um, they you know, there, some of them are forms of knowledge that uh, get their value by being unevenly distributed uh, uh, in the real or the virtual world. Sorry, you've been no, waiting no. patiently. Sorry. Uh, I would like to build on two concepts you, you mentioned. Yeah. One is language shift, and the other one is this social linguistic diversity. Yeah. So, so, super diversity, which I found very interesting. So, I found out that people in the U.S. really like to use acronyms. Like yes. and and things like lol and and what is it? Uh, L, 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 LOL. Oh yeah, 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 right. And at some point, and we have emojis, and we have like SMS where we have like L8 and so stuff like that. Yeah. And there are even some um, ones like FOMO where people know what they mean, but I've had a hard time trying to find out what stand what it stands for, which is fear of missing out, and which is very, also very particular. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if, if I manage to master all this, if my professors would be happy if I use it on a paper, or if they rather will tell me, please don't use it. And what I'm talking about is we see again this tension between like language preservation and regeneration in a language which is English, which is not considered as endangered. But we see like this moving along. So my question would be, would you see this as a sort of endangerment for English? Or would you see it like a shift which would enrich it? And should we do something about it? Uh, they see this as a, this meaning uh, the, the growth of emojis or something it, like it's that? Not, it's not just emojis. It's, it's just the explosions of new words, acronyms, signs, a different type of language. Uh -huh. I, 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 I don't see that as endangering anything, but uh, except, I mean, except, you know, like, my own level of nuanced comprehension of, of uh, texts that contain emojis that, I, that I'm not familiar with, but I mean, I think that, that well, I think that that phenomenon that I've just sort of jokingly described, in which you know, um, the use of certain linguistic forms inevitably uh, ends up including some people. Some people are in on the joke or the usage, and some people aren't. 
Uh, that's true of all communication, I mean, all communication using language. So I don't see that as anything particularly new. I know that there are people who, I mean, it's a perennial, I mean, it's a perennial, and you can do a historical study, and you can, I'm sure, go back a hundred years, people predicting the downfall of proper language based on, you know, the, the pernicious influence of texting or emojis or whatever. I mean, these are, these are interesting things to study socially, the emergence of these discourses of alarm and moral panic over language, but I think that the actual phenomena are just things you find everywhere. I don't, have I addressed your, I mean... Yeah, I was just curious if, if this one, if, if, if this moves from being like marginal college trend to actual language, if it, if it, if it becomes like sort of that, if it endangers like proper English, and if we want to see a Shakespeare play where people use this sort of things within 20 years, what would tra a traditional linguist say? That's, that's what I'm trying to find. Um, well, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think, I, I don't think I will attempt to speak on behalf of traditional linguists because there's enough people in the room who know me uh, who are already laughing at the very idea of me doing that. Um, but but um, I do think that, that, that one thing that, um, that, that um, one point of view on some of these issues that I think I would share with many contemporary students of sociolinguistics and of linguistics is that this idea that, you know, that this idea that, okay, the use of emojis in a, in a, in a, on a phone is one thing, but what if, it, what, if it, what if it ends up affecting the real language? If you, you, I think the category, the real language, is, needs to be put into question. And, and by that I, I, don't mean, I don't mean hastily rejected, and I don't mean cheaply denounced, I mean where did we get an idea that there were sort of um, harmless, fun, sort of unreal language practices around the margins and then something in the middle that's, that's the real language and when you start having too much fun, right, the real language is somehow threatened. I think, you know, I think those, are, those kinds of ideas are fascinating and important to, just to study ethnographically. Who espouses those views? When? About what? To whom, with what effects? If you see what I mean. So, discussions of the difference between I don't know slang and the English language um, are, are never really that interesting in terms of the, when taken literally. But they're 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 they can be revelatory if you analyze them as activities. Yes. This relates to that question and also something else I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like that question itself kind of illuminates something that your talk was talking about, which is like the, the, the idea that um, maybe the, the language preservation idea that if you put something in a vault, you're saving it. Yeah. Whereas you're saying, actually, um, you're, you're not doing that at all. You're just putting it in a vault. And, um, the same with like the English language, right? If you you could save it from emojis and stuff if you just like put it in a vault and stopped using it, and it became something that wasn't dynamic. Um, but um, who would care mm -hmm. that you had that? Mm -hmm. Everybody's off doing other stuff. It's more interesting. So um, this related to, to your um, discussion of like this sort of techno utopia where um, people put all these languages <coughs> online. Some electronic form, yeah. you know, universally available. But um, to me, and, and you also said this pretty much, that the techno utopia that they're describing is actually kind of super old fashioned conceptually, right? That, um, I mean, if they're going to do something techno utopia like, they might as well um, actually be utopic about it. And, and, and to me, that would mean like <clears throat> recognizing the more. Um, networked potential of the, the World Wide Web, right? Where that people are actually interacting with those databases um, 
in a more open source type of way. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and they're creating emojis out of endangered speech or languages or whatever they want to do. So in that case, it, um, I think with a more updated understanding of um, what the World Wide Web could do, it could be a place where um, languages can actually um, do what they're supposed to do, like interact with the world you know, in an electronic way. Yep. Um, so I was curious to see what you thought about that. Um, uh... Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that um, uh, the potentials. I mean, the study of um, sort of uh, language variation in the on, in online environments. Um, I think you know, so far suggests that you can observe in the online environments many of the um, interactionally significant. Um, Dynamics of language use that you can you can you can observe in face to face communication, but the but the conditions are somewhat different, and the the uh, you know uh, the utterances are there to be referred back to and recirculated and decontextualized and recontextualized in ways that are not as um, easy to do face to face. Um, but I, I'm sorry, but I mean let me apologize for not. Following up your question to its full potential, because while, because something just occurred to me about the previous question, which was about you know like are emojis and texts and abbreviations and acronyms and things kind of encroaching on the real language, and like I was suddenly I was reminded of you know this the classic study by the Jane Hill and Ken Hill of uh, of uh, language shift in Central Mexico. There were people okay in that in that study um, kind of. Two, two large. I mean, we're simplifying grossly, but she looked at um, you know older males who were in the village and who were deeply embedded in the whole system of uh, compadrazgo of a uh, of uh, you know ritual reciprocity, and this was a powerful economic system and a system of prestige and, and everything located in the villages. And then post World War II, there got to be you can, uh, work opportunities for work in small factories away from the villages. And so there were, Dead Hills also talked to a bunch of guys who were guys who were factory workers in the towns, okay? Now, factory workers in the towns viewed the Spanish language as like an emoji thing that was threatening the purity of Mexicana. And, and, and they, it was they who were the advocates for purified, uh, legitimate, Legitimate, they call it, you know, purified Mexicano, right? Get rid of those, scrub out all those Spanish loan words and speak only the pure language because you see, Spanish was threatening the real language. Uh, meanwhile, the old guys in the village who are, you know, embedded in the Compadrazgo system, when they give a formal speech that's something they consider important, oh, they load in as much Spanish vocabulary as possible because for them the presence of Spanish <clears throat> Spanish elements in a mostly Mexicano utterance gives it importance and prestige. Well, guess what? The factory workers who were espousing the purest ideology were in fact leading the, sh the shift to Spanish even as they even as they explicitly disavowed it. So I'm just that just you see the, you see the connection to your is it just um, the the ironies that result? That there are all kinds of ironic um, outcomes to these political politics of language kind of issues. Yeah, I just uh, following directly up on that, I uh, wanted to comment that uh, I think the point that's being made is that um, with respect to the, the data from the Hill and Hill ethnography, um, it's the question becomes like, okay, so where does that fit into the ontology that you showed us? Yeah. And, and that's kind of precisely the point, right, is that it sort totally. of doesn't, especially if we, if we think about um, what you were getting at, the, the, the way, the, the connectivity of the web that, as it exists now, we can think of, this is very web 1.0, mm -hmm. and we live in a web 2.0 kind of world. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of, I mean, that's a really reductionist way to say it, but I think cause that, that was kind of your point, right? Yeah. Um, and so then that actually builds into um, the question that I wanted to ask before, or perhaps it's just a comment and it's kind of half-cooked, but 
I think it's important um, to remember that this happened in the world and, and can perhaps um, you know, shed some light on as an alternative case. Um, and that is that when we think about the vault in particular, and this issue of the relationship between the um, documentarian, what was it, documentary linguist, I think? Yeah. So um, there is actually an example of this sort of um, scholarly enterprise having happened before. And that is um, in the 20s and 30s in the Soviet Union, when the um, Bolshevik government was trying to figure out how to actually rule um, you know, what had previously been the Russian Empire, they sent out an army of ethnographers. And they were, in fact, actually organized like an army with generals and brigadiers and everything. Wow. And they went out into every village that they could get to with a checklist of a box. And it said, what is the name of this group? What is the national hat of this group? What is the national food of this group? What is the national language, et cetera? And they went down the list, and they did it. And they took it, and they plotted it on a map. Mm -hmm. And based on that information, to the best of their, I mean, keep in mind, this is in the 20s and 30s. So like, their ability to visualize this information, that's an incredible accomplishment um, to begin with. And then on that basis, that was how they decided where to draw the borders between all of the um, Soviet republics. So that is like, holy crap, like this is over. <laughs> The effect that this kind of thing can have on the world is it really, I mean, like, whoa. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about <laughs> um, the <Technical virus>. <laughs> So, uh, just a uh, food for thought. Um, yeah. yeah, I would like a, um, like a dialect app. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, sorry. Yeah. I think this also goes a little bit off that, but your um, article in the talk reminded me a lot, we didn't get a lot about David Foster Wallace's famous piece. Anything that gets into dictionaries filters through the ideology of who is writing the dictionaries and what constructs the English language is always filtered through all of right? Which made me think that this story and, and you're, what you're kind of describing is how we conceptualize language, right? What that means, whether we make it a category, a like a boundary category, or should we see it as something that is built by the culture and the society, which is obviously true. But to me, what kind of struck me that I felt could be, that I was curious about was this real idea of power that is built into this structure. This idea of categorization and vaulting who is witnessing and who are these experts to keep alluding to, and what that kind of means um, for a project like this, basically. And for, I'm sorry. For a project like this, and when there's anxieties around that, because I mean, also as a historian of science, this is something that like, people would be like, oh, here we go again, you know? <laughs> like, fear or anxiety around these kind of categorizations that are embedded in someone, some specific ideology, as opposed to ontology, like it's very clearly being guided by a specific set of actors. Yeah, well, I mean, just quickly, and I know, uh, um, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the kind of, um, <clears throat> One of the kind of really basic notions that's at the center of this just discussion of language endangerment that is, is one that appears to have like a, a ton of traction, or it, is, it resonates intuitively somehow with 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 I think with uh, Westerners, <laughs> or uh, is, is the idea the, the idea that, that a language dies when and I seem, since I have like sort of a little visual aid that that. A language dies when the last person who can speak the language dies. And I'd like to suggest that that is a profoundly uh, ideologically saturated notion about what a language is. And, and it partakes of uh, you know, a long Chomskyan uh, tradition in linguistics that sees you know, the object of study of, of linguistics, according to Chomsky, is not things people say. It's the mental capacity, it's linguistic competence, which is the internalized mental capacity to produce an unlimited number of well-formed sentences. Okay? So that internalism is, is one component of this notion that when a language, when the language's last speaker dies, is when the language dies. But, um, I mean, I think from a social point of view, if, if you're, and I, I speak about this because I've actually, you know, been in this situation. But when you get down to three or four like elderly ladies in rocking chairs who are the only people who can speak the language, 
that ship has sailed. I mean, if you know what I mean, the, the, the socially interesting processes of language shift have really all but played themselves out. And they've left a few people scattered around who have this, you know, some bits of knowledge. Uh, but the idea that a language dies when its last speaker dies is, um, I think, uh, open to a lot of question. I mean, if, we, if we've learned anything, this part of the analysis, <coughs> Part of the, um, and several people have now pointed to it, the, the, uh, the, the weirdly techno-geeky quality of this discourse uh, combined with the completely out of date and antiquated level of a lot of the thinking um, 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 is, um, well, I mean, it, it can be seen in this notion that uh, Languages, you know, live between the ears of individual speakers. Uh, and I mean, if we know, if we if we've learned anything from like hmm, forty or fifty years worth of linguistic <coughs> anthropology, it's that we need to study uh, processes of verbal interaction, in which it's not just the denotational content of the forms, but it's the indexical. Uh, values uh, and the effects of saying such and such in Nahuatl or, or Spanish or the effects of saying it in a certain way. So, um, Mariam. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think, I see. I mean, I think this kind of Kyle's point about this being, oh, what was there before? Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, this being something that sort of offers itself as a um, easily accessible compendium of information. Um, but in fact, um, in, in fact, very difficult even to access. Uh, much less is it, 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 it. You know, this is not designed to be open to any. You know, for, you know, for me to jump in and say, "Hey, I've just invented 25 words of, of Beaver at the Baskin," right? Like Urban Dictionary. So. You can't even thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah. that's the really, real quick. That's one of the really interesting things about Urban Dictionary is that upvote downvote uh, you know, uh, feature because you have um, competing definitions for the terms, um, and you'll see like uh, actual arguments playing out, uh, which is I think what you were kind of imagining about the, the whole like the connectivity of the web as it presents itself to us, um, you know, being an important feature. Of the because then um, the linguists are the only one who get to provide the meta descriptions. Yeah. Yep, but at the same time, the idea that the I mean, I can see the up down. I mean, I'm not a super connoisseur of Urban Dictionary. I've of course used it, but <laughs> but, uh, but uh, um, you know, the upvoting downvoting can probably help weed out, you know, truly random, stupid, or you know, outrageous stuff. But I but I don't think we should be I don't think we should be sort of seduced by the uh, pseudo-democracy 
uh, uh, of these environments into thinking that you know, like the, the proper definition of words can be a, can be arrived at by vote, by right? plebiscite. Since since I can jump on there and vote 500 times, right? Or, yeah. Well, I think maybe perhaps one another thinking about the multiple modes of connectivity on the internet, you can sort of um, think about the ways that things on Urban Dictionary, for instance, with this upvote downvote. Um, you know, trend, you can look at the Google engrams. Um, yes. And if there's a way to link those together, I mean, that would be. Yeah. It's like what you did at the very beginning of the paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yes. Just a quick quick question. You were talking about uh, the, the four old ladies in rocking chairs and language being therefore already gone in some sense. Um, has anybody ever tried to make a notion, an analogous notion for language of minimal viable breeding population or some such thing, would that make you any more comfortable? Would that be a, any more useful definition of language death for you? Um, I would say, imagine no. Okay. <laughs> but, that, but that raises Thumbs up. But if you're, if you're, already, you're already past the notion of between one person's ears there, so that raises further questions. Yeah, well, I mean, frankly, it's kind of weird to, I mean, or, I mean it's not, it may be kind of weird to admit this, but it seems kind of germane. Like, my, my own work, my own ethnographic work, has mostly been in that situation and studying not optimal breeding populations, but what does a community, because it sort of turns out to be not so uncommon, that just as the community is down to three or four old ladies who can really speak the language, at the same time, suddenly the language is very important. And suddenly, there's support for documentation, for classrooms, for, right? And so the language becomes important for all kinds of people who have a relationship to it that is not at all that of the fluent L1 speaker, but who are, you know, who are people who, who uh, are related to the language, you might say, through kinship, who view it as theirs, even though they can't speak it. So what do you do then, right? What kind of, so there, the language is going to have a kind of, I'm not referring to a game now, but language is going to have a kind of second life within a realm of valued cultural heirlooms. And then you, then you have an interesting politics of access to the kind of partly uh, museumified uh, language. I mean, at Warm Springs, you know, I'm describing that, I mean, I mean basing my, what I'm saying on that, Situation. They set up language classes for adults in one of the languages, the ones I, the one I was interested in. And okay, it's a reservation community with three tribes, or you know, distinct linguistic and cultural groups. Right? I mean, unrelated. Un, it's not two kinds of Apaches. It's three completely different groups. Okay. They've all inter. There's been a tremendous amount of intermarriage. Okay. So it's not like. Uh, Claims to tribal identity are really all that salient or important to people. But the interesting thing is when they set up adult language classes, all these people suddenly surfaced as Wascos from families that nobody had considered as Wascos. But it's a language class, so it should be open to anybody who wants to put in the work. Though there's a kind of modern uh, ist idea there. Um, uh, so anyway, all kinds of sort of socially interesting things can continue to happen with and around uh, the language even after it has ceased for a long time to be, you know, the primary medium of communication for anybody in the in the speech community. So I mean, I don't I don't know if that really answered your question or just sure. did the sort of guest speaker thing of launching into something else. <laughs> yeah. wrote a piece of his called Latent Extinction. It really, sort of the analogy to the ground on the rocking chair was a certain tree hmm. um, in a forest that he studies, I can't remember the name of, but that already just the existence of it standing there alone without its ecology 
is signaling that, you know, whatever things have already gone differently and that this is the last tree standing. And so um, Dr. Jansen's approach is and critique of conservation biology is very similar to your critique of language um, extinction, which is let's not pick and choose species to, you know, save, but let's just you know, mark off a plot of land and see what happens. Let's see the, uh, the kind of diversity that will appear that we actually don't even know in advance what is what might appear. And so it's interesting to me to think that the other side of the study of language extinction is the study of the acquisition of super diversity. Um, and I just wonder what the state of science, ethnography is around that, and if I think of some great 20th century intellectuals, Albert Hirschman, fled Nazi Germany, went through France, acquired French, Spain, acquired Spanish, you know, wife is Russian, I mean, these were multilingual speakers who acquired this super diversity of language through war, and is it kind of ironic that, you know, today, under conditions of so much war, we have this super diversity. Um, so is it super diversity? Should, is, how do we study that? I mean, how do we, do, 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 what's the state of knowledge around this? Uh, you know, and, and it's easier to study, you know, the grandmas in the rocking chairs and, you know, I don't know. Well, jeez. Uh, well, I mean, there is a, I mean... It would be impossible to study. I mean, you'd have to know so many languages to, to understand how the acquisition of multilingualism occurs in these different settings. You know? And these are very, I mean, talk about lack of coevalness. How do you do that kind of work in, in the moment? Um, well, uh, um, well uh, one way to approach I mean, it's a huge, obviously, you realize a gigantic kind of question, but one way to approach it would be to say that, that, that I, I guess one thing I'm kind of arguing for is let's, uh, let's uh, try, please, uh, to get past these in European Eurocentric romantic notions that there have ever existed uh, societies and languages that, that, that have lived in pristine isolation uh, away from any kind of power uh, or uh, conflict and are like natural, right? Uh, so in other words, that it, I guess I would say that, it, that, the, that, that the processes that produce the three old ladies in the, in the rocking chairs and the processes that produce uh, 400 languages being spoken in London um, are actually quite similar. Uh, and their processes of, of, well, in a narrowly focused linguistic sense, uh, processes of language contact and language change, those are all, language contact and language change is always and only the product of forces within the community that assign different values to different languages, right? And make one of them, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're an old guy in a village in central Mexico and you want to sound important, you sprinkle all kinds of Spanish in. But in most of your life, you speak Mexicano, right? Um, what, so, so in both the old ladies and the, the, whatever process results in the three old ladies in their rocking chairs, and whatever process results from the commingling of incredibly diverse groups of people in contemporary urban centers in Europe and America, they have to be studied by the same set of methods. That's what I guess I would suggest. Yeah, just a quick um, you know, point on, on drawing out, I think, some of the complexities and, and, and extreme difficulties in actually accomplishing that. Like, um, from my, my own personal experience this past summer, I was a um, study abroad student in Tajikistan. And my host family, um, their main language that they spoke amongst each other was Uzbek. Uh -huh. I was studying Farsi, <laughs> which is a dialect of Persian. Um, they, the official language of the country is Tajik, which is another Persian dialect. And the main language that we actually spoke with each other was Russian. So, like, 
And that situation got really out of hand really quickly as far as like <laughs> actually understanding each other for the most part. Um, so like thinking about it in terms of an actual, because I'm an archaeologist obviously, but if I was you know studying um, language in that context, like I mean, <laughs> you might as well just carry a tape recorder around with you and have it on all day because like well, who knows what you're gonna observe in that yeah, environment. And, that, and that's going on all over the world, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, like, you know, there's all this talk about, like, reduction in the number of the world's languages. I, I mean, not to take anything away from the, you know, the misery and the human, the, the human misery of current migration crises, right? Um, I think, um, I think a lot of new languages are being, are in formation. Um, uh, if you know what I mean, though. So, I mean, I do think the, the diversity in at least ways of speaking, I mean, I'm sure the Russian that you, you and your host family um, used with each other probably has some, you know, some, some special features, phonology, vocabulary, etc., that wouldn't be in the standard textbook of the real grammar of the real Russian language. Let's thank Dr. Moore again, please. Thanks. Class will be as usual. Great job. Oh, thanks. Very good. Yeah, I did. I just did. I don't know. Thank you. I guess I was really struck by the bad as this is kind of a waste of time. So, but you're coming along with the people this way. So, maybe you're actually an excellent CBO system. Like Del Ives.